Still not quite used to looking so high up here. I don't know, I guess the cam I hope the camera angle actually looks good for you all, because for me it's just kind of... <laughs> Wally! I gotta share a little anecdote. A friend of mine was like, hey, how's it going? Because, you know, everyone knows, uh, even amongst my friends and family, that I'm in a recording cycle and they know exactly what that means for me. And I, rather literally entirely, was like, it's okay, I'm about halfway through the Pixar block. And they're like, sweet, grats. And I'm like, yeah, thanks. And then I counted, no, I'm not yet halfway there. <laughs> it makes sense that I would make that mistake, though, after all. Of the upcoming 13-ish films, seven of them I've either never seen or kind of never seen. So, you know, there's a lot there that I don't really tend to consider. And the other seven or so... I would be like, yeah, no, I've, I've, I've managed these ones, so I've got to be on the downswing, right? No, we've got a lot to go. I do hope you are still enjoying this journey through the Pixar block. I am. And this film, while Incredibles is very good, this film probably is the only other one that, that kind of, uh, I don't want to use the word surpasses. It comes really close to, to, to that. It, it, it equals out. It's right up there in the top three or whatever for me when it comes to Pixar films. It's funny because this film was an idea that was percolating around the animation studio since 94. Now, if you were paying attention all the way back in the first few ruminations we did in the Pixar block, one of the things I kept mentioning was that they really wanted to do X, Y, and Z, and they couldn't. It just, it wasn't feasible. It was not in the cards. They didn't have the tech or the time or the budget or whatever they needed to do it. So when they started actually getting Toy Story going, it's like, God, we're really going to do this. Yeah. They had a bunch of story ideas. Stanton himself was really entranced with the, he calls it a romantic idea of the last robot left on Earth. You know, no, ever, someone forgot to turn off the one robot left on Earth and just the story idea built over the years from that. But, he and the others uh, in the main creative team looked at that idea and said, we can't do that. We, we don't have the tech, we don't have the budget, etc. So they just kind of kept workshopping it, using the brain trust concept in order to develop it and try to modify it as they go and maybe do something with it going forwards. But I bring all this up because this is one of the reasons why Wally -E feels like an early Pixar film. Because it kind of is. It, it effectively is just done later when they could actually do it. This is something you see periodically where a film, television, or game producer puts out something that feels like their early works because they've technically been working on it since then and it's just taken this long to get to the, to the point where they are capable of actually doing it. To really go into this with the whole concept thing I already mentioned, there is very little dialogue in this film and very few voice actors for the film. Originally, there were going to be even less, because originally these people were not going to be speaking English or an understandable language, which would mean, I'd say about 98-ish to 99% of the film would be effectively devoid of dialogue. Now, obviously, there is a you know, Wally directive and stuff like that, but you, you do see what I mean, and you can kind of understand how interesting that would have been. I'm not sure what I think of that. I kind of prefer the fact that the captain and the people can talk, but... That is just me, and, of course, because it's one of my favorite scenes of the movie, but anyways. So, they, and the other thing they wanted, they wanted this big twist. Because it was going to be falling around these big alien gelatinous blob things. And they just kept running into issues with it. The big twist was that this is what had descended from humanity seven centuries ago. But no matter how they kept working with it, it just didn't work animation-wise. They just couldn't make it into something that they found to be acceptable. So after a lot of workshopping and working on, they're finally like, okay, fine, let's, let's, at this point, they're half human anyways. Let's just make them human. Okay, okay. Now, another thing I want to mention here, Ben Burt, some of you may recognize that name. He's a big Star Wars guy, uh, someone who was pretty much singularly responsible for at least half of the sound design of the droids in the prequel trilogy was brought on to do this film. Now, originally he was like, no, no, I'm not doing it. But he actually saw the treaties and the premise and the ideas, and he was like, okay. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that. Let, let, let's, let's do this. Let's see how this works. And good on him, and he did, oh my god, he absolutely does an amazing job. 
I could probably do an entire one hour video discussing and analyzing the specific nitpicking ways in which he uses sound and barely perceptible words that aren't quite speech to personify about a dozen or so robots, and each of them have their own clearly audible personality that differentiates, differentiates them even if you can't see them. You can still tell which one you're looking at based on how they're designed sound-wise. And there's a little bit of personality in each of them, too. <laughs> huge props. Huge props. Just a couple right off the top of my head examples. Uh, the secu Not the Securitron. Um, oh, I don't remember any of their names because none of them are said in the film. Uh, the little gopher dude. Yeah, the go go uh, four or something like that. Who's got that little... <laughs> or maybe the, the out-of-control massage bot that's basically the Hulk. Or, obviously, Otto, which has his very flat and distinct voice. And is also one of the only straight English-speaking bots that we see to help distinguish him. Or it. Might actually borrow more accurate. And so forth and so on. I, again... All of them have their own unique flavors and voices, and it is brilliant work. Another thing they did, the tech for this film wasn't really pushed forward, but they used what they had substantially. Again, this was the whole point here, was to use the tech they'd been developing for years. And they did. One of the things they did was they really mess with color. Now, lighting is something they'd been using for a little while. This goes back, uh, at the very least, to cars, but arguably before that. But with the new lighting ideas and engines and the new animation and the new ground tracking and the new ray tracing and the new making sure that the physics is all right, all of that stuff combined helped to add to the visual style of it. But the color is the most unique thing. If you pay attention, and this is brilliant, because I'll admit I've never noticed this before. When you start off the film, it's very brown. It's like Grand Theft Auto 4, right? Just brown and grays and dismals. And there's two colors that are distinct here. One is there are a few things that are yellow. Mostly the by and large stuff. Wally himself being a, you know, example of that. But there's this big, bluff, gruff, muddy tone to everything. So that when he finds the plant, the simple green of it pops out immediately. Now this is actually classic visual design. If you want a color to pop, you remove it from the rest of the picture, right? But still, it's a very effective trick, and when used properly, can really add some excellent visual emphasis. Shortly after this, Eve lands, and the color pink and the color blue are added to the palette, simply by her arrival. And you start to see the clouds change a little bit, and the, the lighting uh, filters are kind of lessened a little bit. It's a little... Mm, less uh, desaturated, I guess. More colorful, effectively. And then then that color tone kind of consists until they go through space, which is just a kaleidoscope, until they get to the axiom. Now, the axiom is bright, but very sterile. Almost every color there is uh, very cold, to use simple lighting terms. Uh, like, for example, that light right there I have on me is actually specifically designed to be cold, Whereas that one over there is designed to be warm in order to try and make a more natural environment for the studio. You know, stuff like that. Imagine if that light was completely off and all you had was the, the halogen light, right? The Walmart blaring white, kind of bluish, cold tone. You know what I'm talking about. Just whoosh. And then almost all of the axiom is like that. But if you pay attention, and this is cute, as they go through the axiom, more and more color tints start slowly entering the palette as the scenes progress. Until finally they go back to Earth and yada yada. So I, I just wanted to go through that whole mess because it's rare I get to talk about something as excellent as color design in a film. But this might be one of the better examples I've seen in a long time. It reminds me of Beauty and the Beast, actually, which is another film that used color to excellent effect. <sighs> um, Let's see here. So, uh, this film cost about $180 million, made about $520 million. This was considered relatively low for the standards of the time, but, well, that's the other thing I wanted to comment on. I know several people when this film came out who were like, ugh, the film's too preachy. And a lot of the word of mouth that I heard was to that exact effect. Oh, don't go watch it, it's too preachy. I don't know if that had any tangible effect on its sales figures because I am one sample size with you know just a handful of people around me who were repeating the same thing. But I, of course, went to see it because it's a Pixar film. And 
Why wouldn't I? I liked it. I was totally into it. Like I said, this is at the moment effectively tied for my favorite of the series so far. And that's after going through with analysis mode on. But I can see how it wouldn't be for everyone because this really is probably the most concept film of the concept film so far. The plot is extremely simple and I don't want to say it's weak because it's not, but it is barely there. And the character focus, while there is a lot of characterization, and there is a character arc for almost every character in the entire film, it's really short hops as far as the character arcs. Instead, this film seems to lean heavily on the concept and the way that it visualizes and utilizes that. It's worth noting, if you've ever actually seen the script for this film, I've only seen bits of it myself, I was able to find a site that tracks that kind of thing, uh, the script is written completely unlike what most scripts are. There actually is dialogue written for several of the bots who don't actually speak in the film. But for the most part, the script is just seen. Here's, you know, and they bumble in and then the thing goes off and then this goes over and he gets knocked over and then he gets to be put back on the thing. And that's the scene. It was far more visual than anything else. You'll also notice how this follows a trend by virtue of technically having started it because, they again, they wanted to do this earlier. The physicality trend, something that's been showing up in several Pixar films so far, where the slapstick and the visual physical humor is something that's been very present. It is all over this film, but it's not just humor, and I think that's what salvages it. Rather than humor, it is a, a severe... a sequence of scenes that manages to showcase just light, you know, life on the planet and then life for Wally, and then life with Eve, and then life on the Axiom, and then change. And you'll notice that almost two-thirds of the film is all devoted towards establishment. It's in a similar way that Monsters, Inc. would, but much longer, because far more of the film is devoted towards setting the stage than it is towards doing the payoff. Although the payoff starts very early as well, but you get my point. And that's the last thing I want to praise about this film before I really get started on it. The pacing is weird, but brilliant. There's... I, I'm, I'm not sure I could identify a single second of wasted time in this film. It moves very smoothly. It knows exactly when to shift tone. It changes camera angles repeatedly in order to make sure that there's always showing something that is going on, rather than just getting stagnant on a singular target. But also it does something unusual in the fact that its arcs begin early and then terminate, but each arc tends to set off another arc, which tends to set off another arc. It, it's almost like watching dominoes in movie format, you know? I, I'm probably explaining this terribly, but I hope at least some of you understand what I'm talking about here, because, oh, I eat it up. This is brilliant cinematography. Anyways, so let's talk about the film proper. So, trash. <laughs> God, so much trash. Skyscrapers. Geometric skyscrapers of trash that are taller than the actual skyscrapers. Ugh, yeah, that's, mm, that is absolutely horrifying. This is the other thing. Stanton himself has said that he doesn't believe that this film is dark. Uh, sure. But you'll notice that the intro does a lot to try and showcase this as not being a dark and horrible thing, even though... It probably should be. This arguably could be considered to be the darkest Pixar film so far, uh, surpassing, in my opinion, Finding Nemo and The Incredibles. And yet, at the same time, we look at this, and it's just da 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 And I was thinking about the specifics of that. Now, obviously, part of that is because they wanted to establish that tone for the film, but from an in-universe perspective, it makes sense because that's just kind of how Wally is. You notice that? He has a unique trait. He doesn't get bored. He's been doing this for seven centuries-ish. Unceasingly. But he doesn't get bored. Every day is another day of excitement and adventure for him. And he's always interested in what new things he can find. At no point does it become routine for him. Now that's actually important. Because if it wasn't for that, this would be hell but also because of that, it kind of drives his desire to see and learn. Let me let me try to phrase this differently, because I'm saying this the wrong way. To him, everything is interesting. 
To him, every little thing he's seeing and every little thing he's interacting with are all interesting and engaging, and as a direct consequence of that, are keeping him interested and engaged. Does that make sense? Oh my god, what's over that? What's over that hill? <gasps> it's a rock. Oh, this rock looks really cool. I haven't seen a rock like this before. It's kind of similar to the other rock. I might put it with the other rocks. Now, I, that sounds mocking, but I in no way mean it as such. It's just kind of part of who and how he is. Also, tr trust Pixar to somehow make a cockroach lovable. I'd still probably kill it. I hate cockroaches. Anyways, <clears throat> so they have a trash emergency. Obviously, these people never learn from the Futurama example of just launching their garbage into space. And don't worry, the bots are here to bail you out. We also see that he is cannibalizing his fellows for parts. If you think about it, Wally, this is kind of a logical consequence of what they set up. Because it probably wasn't just the one last bot who was left on. There were probably thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Wallys left behind. Then one of them breaks down. So that one's used for parts. Then another one breaks down, and another one breaks down. And over time, they would naturally kind of... I mean, there would be a little Darwinian thing going on here, as the one that adapted the best and the one that learned the best would be the one that kept going. And of course, that is our Wally, the one I will simply refer to as Wally throughout the course of this film. I might say Wally from time to time just because it's quicker. No, I, I don't do that on purpose. I have done that before. It's okay. Starliners are here. There's no need to walk. It's all good. All we have to do is, is get you, get the Earth back on track. Everything's going to be fine. You just cruise through space. Everything's cool. I have to praise the texture quality on Wally himself. I have commented several times about the impressiveness of the graphics of these films, but this might be the first time where I am legitimately just, wow, that, that, that looks like an actual frickin' robot, you know? Just, I don't know, my opinion. Anywho, <clears throat> so, question. How sentient and sapient do you think Wally is? Now, I'm not even going to give my answer on this one, because I don't think it's particularly relevant for me to give my opinion on the matter. I would find it much more interesting to hear yours. I have heard several debates and discussions about this exact topic, and frankly, I think there's plenty of evidence that he is either developed, developing, or can't develop. And there are bits of evidence that support all three viewpoints that I've heard so far. So, interesting to think about, and I would... Love to hear your thoughts on the matter. But one way or another, he is definitely something of a foreign contaminant. <laughs> Pun intended. I'll get more into that in just a minute. I do love how he likes to collect things and emulate things from the old world. Very Fallout kind of a vibe. My favorite little gag in the beginning is he gets a spork, and he's got a thing of forks and a thing of, excuse me, thing of forks and a thing of spoons, and he's like, um, hmm, whatever. And just puts it in between both of them. We see a sandstorm. Again, very beautiful exposition. Oh, sandstorm coming. Okay, lower the thing. And you notice the sandstorm hits very quickly. You ever wonder what the weather's like on this planet at this point in time? Because it's probably not very pretty. Also, one of the first things we see is that damn debris field while we're on the subject. So, he, he's like, oh, I'm so tired. Gets out there. Oh, coffee. Need the coffee. I mean, the solar power. It's portrayed exactly the same way as most people tend to do coffee in the morning. I thought that was a neat little touch. Um, There's a bit of a montage. We see the fire extinguisher. That's nice. Then we see the green. The green of the plant. This is when she shows up and the blue and the pink, the light, the light red, enter into the spectrum. God, there's so many moving parts on these things. It's almost like they don't know how to make efficient stuff. And do you know what inefficient machinery means? It means waste. Waste of energy, waste of time, waste of parts. The more moving parts you have, the more moving parts you have to replace, the more maintenance you have to undertake. And I only point out that tiny little tidbit because I've never heard anyone else comment on it. But throughout the course of this, we see that the Axiom in, in specific, and by and large in general, use lots and lots of moving parts to do relatively simple tasks, which means lots and lots of energy, lots and lots of replacements, lots and lots of waste. Nice. Give you that one, film. Nice. All right. So she she flies. She goes down, starts scanning. 
Um, why is her cannon so terrifyingly powerful? I know they've got super tech. I mean, they have some kind of faster than light travel since they go from out at the horse head nebula to Earth in a matter of seconds. <laughs> Come on, that's a hell of a trip, right? But, um, you, uh, why, why, why put that on the scouts? Then again, I suppose the scouts could be interacting with any other number of, you know, rad scorpions and feral ghouls and super mutants. So I suppose I can understand why they would want to arm these things. I uh, I love the bit where she takes a moment and just starts flying around and enjoying herself. Just 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 taking a little bit of a breather before she gets back to work. I find myself wondering exactly how often she is cooped up and how little time she has to herself to do anything other than simply sit around and do nothing. So there's some visible frustration going on. There's some neat little scenes here. Uh, it is funny, by the way. She looks, and is, substantially more advanced than him. Good visual distinction to vary the two, by the way. But what's doubly amusing about that is, while she is super advanced, he actually is too, just in totally different ways. This boy has lasted seven centuries, I remind you. And, while we're on the topic, over the montage that goes between the two, she clearly understands concepts that he doesn't. But he also clearly understands concepts that she doesn't. And so the two kind of learn off of each other, which, well, I just described human de development right there. <laughs> I don't think I didn't notice. Uh, so she causes this horrible death. Another sandstorm hits. Um, there's this really cool thing. He He's just, oh my gosh, I've got to show you all this stuff. I've got to show you, uh, what have I got? Oh, yeah. I've got this water bottle. I've got these things I still need to add to the... To the table I just built today. I've got my pen that I make my notes with. Isn't this cool? It's it's not a great pen, but it's got a really good writing stuff. What else have I got? I've got this. I use this to I use this to measure things to make sure I, I have so much measuring in my life. And he's just show, 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 show. It's really cute. But what I find doubly funny is it works from by the, either angle, either you know bringing over a girl or whatever you're interested in for the first time. Yeah, I've been there, or simply having someone to share with for the first time. Uh, possibly ever, depending on how you want to define that. So she is rather gun She is so gun happy. I guess if you had a mega death cannon, you'd probably want to use it semi frequently too. But damn, she is very gun happy. She also does. I, I love when she pulls out the the bubble pop pop. Oh, oh, that's nice. Super efficient. Destroy the bubbles. <laughs> She solves the Rubik's Cube off-camera. They're just so adorable. Wally may be the protagonist of this film. But make no mistake, Eve is the hero, or heroine, if you prefer. And that's going to come up later, too. Because she... Well, she's the heavy, right? <laughs> and he's the plucky comic relief. And you can see where that is. I mean, he gets defeated by a bunch of shopping carts earlier. Which is actually probably my favorite visual gag in the entire film, by the way. Ah! <laughs> <clears throat> so, there's this bit. <sighs> there's this bit where she scans the plant, and the directive overrides her sense of self and actually shuts her down. Yeah, it tracks. <sighs> so he keeps her safe in the storm, tries the sandstorm and the the sludge river. I'd make a joke here, but ugh. you also, uh, you, you know, the ship comes, grabs them. And I had this note here. I wonder how far out they are. I decided to look it up. I actually casually referenced the Horsehead Nebula earlier. And that's apparently where the axiom is at this point in time. It was supposed to only go as far out as the Kuiper Belt. And it's just kind of roamed over the last seven centuries. So that tracks. Anyways. <clears throat> Poor M.O., by the way. comes. Wally is just absolutely filthy, and M.O.'s like, ah, must clean, foreign contaminant. Also one of the main themes of the film, but, you know, whatever. And Wally is, he, he could use a bath, I'm just saying. This also leads to the first real noticeable variance, is what I'm going to call these. Um, M.O. sees the, uh, or Mo, I think is actually calls himself, sees the line and and jumps off the line then goes and cleans after him. 
It's interesting that the lines are not actually mandatory, that that's not their power track, for example, that they can actually roam off of them if they choose to. That also tracks, doesn't it? It's probably one of the most obvious visual metaphors in the whole film, if I might be so bold. So what happens is a bunch of visual stuff, which I'm only going to kind of race through here. Uh, lots and lots of traffic, of course. Keeping a ship of this size running is... Oh, that's that's going to be a nightmare. And at the 39-minute mark, we see our first people, who aren't, you know, the villain. And they're actually taught... The first thing we see is there are these two people who are talking to each other on the phone while they are in arm's reach of each other. Right next to each other, basically. I had to make fun, but I've seen that happen in real life. So that's, again, whatever. But then John gets knocked off. and He's like, huh? Oh, thanks, Wally. And then Mary's on the tram. And this... This is the cool part. This is where the theme starts to really come in. It's actually already shown up a couple of times, but this is when it starts to become a little more woven into the specific events that are happening. When she first breaks out of the, the call, on accident, by the way, Wally accidentally breaks her out of the call. Obviously, her, her uniform changes, color distinction. But then she looks out, and she's just, Wow. And there's this expression like she just hasn't looked outside her tram before. It's possible she hasn't. I didn't know we had a pool. It's said like a joke, and later John repeats it. But there's sincerity there. She really didn't know they had a pool. She was so cloistered that she wasn't even aware of something that was on the luxury cruise yacht. Ahem. <clears throat> So Otto shows up. I don't know if I want to talk about this now or later. I think I'll talk about it later. Sorry, I was just debating. Otto shows up. He has the halli, so you know he's evil. I'm actually going to call Otto an it. Because Otto is probably the least uh, sentient sapient of the very bo various bots. Maybe. Even that is actually a debatable thing. Again, I don't want to give my opinion on the matter. I'm just saying he's... I just screwed up. It is clearly the most bot-like of the bots, which is, of course, very appropriate, since Otto is the one who speaks constantly in full sentenced English, whereas all the others can't or don't. We see the captains. That's a hell of a shot. Also, you notice how some of the captains ran the ship for in the centuries range. Then he gets... Oh, this is it, of course. Oh, I can't believe you didn't wake me. Oh, I mean, honestly, this is the, the only thing I actually get to do on this ship. Remember that point for later. And we hear Sigourney Weaver is the voice of the ship. That's very appropriate as well. There's this bit where Wally... This is one of the tiniest moments of the main theme that shows up. That I've never heard anyone comment on this specific point. So I just want... i got to bring it up. Wally goes by and there's this little punch thing. And it just punches at the things. And then Wally looks up and Wally waves. And looks down and it... Waves its thing in a very uncertain thing. And when they leave later, the puncher looks up and waves, far more enthusiastically and sure of itself. Huh. So they go to the malfunction area. Lots of malfunctioning bots. Yeah, that makes sense. While they go through the repair area, the captain starts wiki-diving. Never go wiki-diving. He'll never come back. He does go through what is effectively the wiki dive. He just brand what's Earth? Fast forward, fast forward, fast forward. What's a hoedown? I, I mean, come on. <laughs> you can just see the branching there, right? But um you notice that the repairs they're doing aren't repairs. Once again, this kind of is another highlight of the wastefulness of by and large. We see that they'll put a you know they'll clean them a little bit, but they don't actually affect any real repairs on any of the bots that are there. Don't even, they don't even try to fix them. They just try to prevent them from doing what they're doing. Point in fact, these were probably destined for the trash heap. Because, as we see, this ship generates an enormous amount of trash. Question. Where does it get its resources from? We have a one-line dialogue earlier, which I kind of briefed over here, where they mention uh, re uh, food generation or food recycling or something like that. But that's all we get as far as how they're actually powering all this stuff. Now, they have floating magnet tech, and they have hyperspace and other stuff, so I'm willing to forego the idea that they have replicators or something. But that just makes this all the more tragic, isn't it? Hear me out for just a second. This is pure theory. In Star Trek, 
they have solved the resource problem. They have reached a post-scarcity society or state, at least in certain specific planets. Not the whole galaxy, not even the whole Federation, but just a few specific planets, like the core worlds, like Earth. Now, the reason why is because they have effectively infinite energy, and they have the ability to turn energy into any other matter, which means they have effectively infinite resources, right? Post-scarcity, done. Now, the reason I'm bringing that up here is because they also have the ability to and desire to then recycle those resources right back into the system. No waste. 100% efficiency. Or at the very least, very high efficiency. But what happens when you can replicate matter or food or, or resources or whatever, but you can't do anything with the byproduct it produces? And now you start to see the, what I consider to be the most horrifying thought of the whole film. That what happened here is that they advanced so far and so fast technologically that they could produce infinite resources, but couldn't deproduce those resources. So they were just churning out ch scores upon scores upon scores of everything. And that's why the trash pile is so bad back on Earth. Look at how much waste this ship produces. In the, a matter of just a couple of minutes, we see this thing push out a couple of houses worth of trash. As in, like, the trash piles the size of a house. And then another trash pile the size of a house. Think about it. Anyways, world building aside. So, uh, where are we at? Where are we at here? Um, hmm? Oh, right. Antics. That's what that word is. Sorry, I'm looking at my notes like, what the heck does that say? There's a lot of antics here. Oh, I was asked to comment on this. I think the romance here actually works pretty well. The two spend most of the film getting closer to each other. There's a lot of legitimate chemistry between the two. They are absolutely adorable. And the romance in question is incredibly innocent, which I think is to the film's benefit. Actually, it's one of the weird things. For a film that should be extremely dark, this film is exceptionally innocent. It's all about innocence, actually. Let's go ahead and talk about the main theme. Let's go ahead and discuss this. Is it environmentalism? No, no. I mean, I, sorry, I shouldn't say that. In my opinion, the theme is not environmentalism. And I never thought it was, to be completely honest with you, even when I first saw this. I remember uh, driving home with my friend, discussing it in the car ride home. And you know, he and I were tossing that exact idea back and forth, and I'm like, no, I don't think this is environmentalism. He's like, even with all the environmental damage, I'm like, no. Is it consumerism? No, I don't think it's that either. I think that's more just a, a background element, a, a tertiary at best kind of a thing. Now, I have since learned that one of the intentions was to evoke nostalgia, that nostalgia was supposed to be a big theme of the film. And I can kind of see that with the 60s-ish, 50s-ish kind of thing they have going on with the music and the emulating of the past, but I still don't buy that. Human beings are supremely innocent, and as they develop, you know, at birth, and as they develop, they are introduced to new ideas. Now, we are sufficiently advanced that we can produce new ideas as well, but it is as we interact with other things that we then take those things and expound upon them. You know, I've talked about this concept so many times. You know, you learn more in recess than you do in the classroom, right? Now, I don't have hard evidence of that, but I have seen this in my studies of the species for, for decades at this point, about how people will learn from other people will learn from other people. And it's just this massive exponential growth that then develops into what we call culture, society, and sentience and sapience. It is, in short, what I also refer to as droid effect, Although droid effect is a more specific thing and usually applies to non-people, you know, non-biological people. But you get the point. John and Mary just have ideas introduced to them. And then they bumble into each other. And then they start sharing ideas with each other. And they don't really need another external source at that point because they, they start developing between the two of them. Wally and Eve do the same kind of a thing. And the captain, and just about everyone he interacts with, has the same overall thing. Just as these new concepts are being pressed to him, he's just like, oh, oh. But what if... And and the most important part is they don't just learn stuff. It's not like someone tells them something and they repeat it via rote. Because that's not what I'm talking about at all. 
an idea is presented, and then they take that idea and develop it and do something with it, mentally or literally. And that, I think, is the secondary theme of the film. That kind of burgeoning development, which is all over the place in the film, and indeed, in many ways, is part of the overall plot, getting back to civilization after we have lost so much. I do find myself wondering if any of the other ships are out there. They have, they mentioned that there were other ships, and there would have to be. There's 200 billion people to evacuate. But we never see or hear anything about any of them. And if they show up, they probably would have shown up after the credits start rolling. Interesting to think about. The pacing, God, I love the pacing of this film. Directive, oh, this is amazing. Um, most of the individuals that Wally interacts with, change a little bit. They go outside of their usual borders. He is, I, I made this joke earlier, but I say this with total sincerity, he is a foreign contaminant for their minds, an external perspective, an idea maker, that then produces these ideas that they take and run with, right? As I've already mentioned. You'll notice Eve is the exception there so far. She has yet to actually deviate. Oh, she likes him. She likes flying. But she is still actually following her programming and staying within her bubble. Now, Mary, I love the bit with Mary and John playing at the pool, by the way. That's really cool. And then we see the shots of the Earth. <sighs> yeah, that's, uh, that's got to be a hell of a shock, isn't it? That uh, You'll notice it doesn't dissuade him. It does, however, give him pause. Now, he ta as he's talking to the poor planet, he's like, you, know, you just need someone to look after you, don't you? This is the second time A113 shows up. Obvious reference. We all know the A113 joke. I haven't even been bringing it up as I go. There's so many Easter eggs. There's whole YouTube channels about Easter eggs for Pixar. You can go follow those if you want. I don't mind. Um, there's lists. But in this case, the only reason I bring it up here is because we saw it earlier show up very briefly when Otto was like, hmm. And now it shows up again. This then leads to the closest thing to a villain in this. Now... I bring this up because, as I've mentioned, several Pixar films, especially in this era, don't have a central villain. Now, some of them do, and some of them work very well. Incredibles and the upcoming Toy Story 3 are good examples of that. In this film, there is a villain, but it's a big asterisk, I think. You might say, oh, it's Otto, right? No. Although, that is a debatable thing for something we'll get to in just a minute, but Otto really is just doing his job. No. The closest thing to the main villain is Shelby Forthright, the president of the planet, and, of course, of by and large. Well, at this point, we're just going to say it's easier to stay in space. We might be able to fix the Earth, and according to the post-credits, they actually can. But we're just going to stay out in space and say, screw it. Why even bother, right? This leads to what is, for me, the best scene in the film. And I think that's partially because it speaks so much to me personally. It also is what I consider to be the central theme of the film. There's this calm, yet strangely chilling music playing. It's a strings piece. And it almost sounds like the kind of tension music that would play as the, as the, the protagonists are looking around for the horror movie monster. It also plays while Otto is advancing and, you know, presenting himself around the captain. But during this scene, and I quote, I can't just sit here and do nothing. That's all I've ever done. That's all anyone on this blasted ship has ever done. On the axiom you will survive. I don't want to survive. I want to live. The captain, crucially, is not lazy. He is, he's fat, arguably, but he's not slovenly. He's not <sighs> any of the negative traits that you might assume. In fact, none of them have that. The moment that concepts are introduced to them, like standing or helping each other out, there's a bit where the ship tilts, and for some reason everyone falls to one side, and as they're tilting, people just start reaching out to help each other. They don't always succeed, but they, they see someone's falling, and it just, ah, I got gotcha. you. I'll help you. And and the first few people fail, but then they start to succeed as they form chains of people and start keeping people safe. 
These are good people. Innocent people. And you see how this ties into the secondary theme. The first theme, I wrote it down here. Forgive me for just referring to my notes because I, I want to say this. The main theme, 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 blah, theme, is learning, going, being, doing. Actually getting out there, not taking the easy route, not bothering to just say, it's too much for me. Throwing your hands up and giving up and walking home and just going with the easy route, the comfortable route, but actually getting out there and freaking doing something. I can't put into words how much I legitimately believe in that concept in real life, how much that resonates with me, how much it is present in every aspect of this film, how Wally does it, how Eve does it. How the captain does it. I, I literally could go down the list of every character in this film, except for Mr. Forthright, the closest thing to an actual villain we get. All of them try, go, be, do. Otto fries uh, Wally's circuit board. <laughs> Burns a hole through it. This is also when we see the trash. And the first time we see the Wallays, actually, the macroscopic Wallies. Notice how they're kind of doing the same general thing, but then they notice and they're like, oh gosh. And they start to help and they wave as they go. Because they're friendly too. Because of course they are. Emo finally manages to clean Wally, which then satisfies him. And then Wally and Emo make up. That's actually a really cool moment. This is when, uh, well, I don't have a better way to put this. This is when Eve turns into total badass mode and, and really shows off why I called her the heroine, why she is the one who is going and actually smashing through the ship with the gun, carrying her beloved in her arms. It's a great, it's a great tidbit. I don't have anything else to add to that. It's just awesome. And uh, she leads the whole army of the misfits. But this is the funny part. This is when Otto is the final, uh, the final victim of the foreign contaminant. It's subtle at first. We see that he has established a few protocols, and in so doing, two things happen very quickly. One, the babies start crying because no one's taking care of them, and two, several people who were on the... I think it's literally two people, actually, who were on their little pads get knocked off of them and knocked aside by the security bots. Security, I think it's whatever. You get the point. You get the pun. There's all puns. This goes even further later. He actually attacks the captain. Then he attacks the captain with his frickin' taser. Then he tilts the ship, nearly getting several people killed in the process. I love the irony of this, that Otto has been forced to go beyond his directive and beyond his primary pr perspective and thinking in a similar way that everyone else has. Now, I, I kind of skipped over it. Earlier, Eve had her moment. Uh, it was when they were in the trash compactor, and she saves him, and he's just, here, I've got I got the plant. She's like, I don't care about the friggin' plant. I care about you. Willing to go beyond, well, willing to go out of line, <laughs> to put it into simplistic terms. But I love how Otto is the last one to become victim to that. This, uh, this climax, God, I love the pacing of this film. This climax has been building for like 20 solid minutes. And it's just this non it's, it's one of the most smooth and gentle curves up in pacing I've seen in a long time. It's right up there with Aliens, which I covered earlier this year. Great, great stuff. Um, the people start helping each other. I already mentioned that. The scenes also bother to cut right back and forth between the micro and the macro. On the macro side is the main plot. Getting the plant in there, getting the ship back home, getting it landed. On the micro side is Wally, who has been severely damaged beyond repair. Now, Eve's desperation to help Wally. Whoa. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mention the Pixar Tears thing. Actually, I totally did. But I forgot to say it was the Pixar Tears moment for me. It was the earlier scene. I want to live. That was the Pixar Tears moment for me in this film. Curious as ever what yours is. This scene didn't work for me as well as it probably should have when Eve is desperate to save Wally. It's a great scene. The, the, the rapidity of how she operates and the animation, to, 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 bam, and then shoots a hole in the ceiling so he can get the sunlight three seconds faster than if he, she just carried him outside. Great stuff. And then when he comes active, his animation is completely different. I love the storytelling through animation in this film. I really, really do. 
He's just very plain. Very robot-like. There's no fluidity. There's no personality to how he moves. He just... Now... I, I don't know if I like this. I'm On the one hand, I don't want to have a downer ending. Don't mistake me. But on the other hand, I kind of hate the fake out. I kind of would have rather that he just was better and that she succeeded at saving him. Okay. Or that she didn't and that Wally was dead. And I, I don't know if it's better that he literally is destroyed or that he is just he's reset and now she has to start all over with him. I'm not sure which would be- work better. If I was writing this film, I probably would run that around the the office a little bit to get some buy-in and see what people think of that. And, of course, that's what I'm doing right now. What do you think? How would you resolve this one? Would you just do it as in the film? Would you have her have to start over with a brand new Wally? Would you have him straight up die? Or would you come up with something else that I can't even think of because I'm too stupid and ugly? (sighs) Oh, I loved this film. But I got one last thing to share. One last thing to share. When I first saw this film, well... I already alluded to this. Theaters, friend. And we have a kind of a thing, he and I. Uh, as soon as we get to the point where the credits are about to roll, we know that. And we get up and we get out so that we're getting out of the exit way when the credits start to roll and people are already now getting up. So we get out ahead of the crowd and we get out ahead of the traffic, right? We're pretty good at it. We've got it down to a precision. As a consequence, there's a few movies whose mid credit scenes I missed, including this one. One of the things we discussed was how there's no way in hell those humans are going to survive. There's no way. They're all dead. And that's just really horrible and dark. I can't believe they even showed that in the film. Now, (laughs) I've seen this film a few times, but only the most recent viewing prior to this. So if this is viewing two, back in viewing one, it's probably probably like viewing five or four, but you get my point, um, was the first time I ever actually sat and watched the mid-credits. I was like, Huh, I, I guess they do survive, and they do manage it somehow. Probably from all the tech they have, and probably from the other ships that come back. Imagine to my amusement that I discovered that they had uh, found out that all the test audiences had the exact same reaction that both my friend and I did. Oh yeah, no, they're screwed. And so, uh, what, I wrote down his name, Jim Capabianco, who actually did a thing for Ratatouille, a little short story for Ratatouille. He was tasked to come up with that credit sequence in a style reminiscing of older culture to kind of showcase how humans are regaining their culture, which is really cool, in order to ensure people know it's okay, it's okay, they live. How many of you thought they lived until you saw that? I'm I'm actually quite curious. And I very much enjoyed this film. Thank you all for your time and your attention. I do hope you have enjoyed. I'll see you next time.